Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome back to Cults to Consciousness. My name is Shalise Ansola, and today we are joined by a special guest who we just had on the show. Thanks so much for joining us, Joelle. Thank you so much, Shalise. It's great to be with you again. Yeah, we had a great response on the video we just released with you um, yesterday, and everyone's like, we want more Joelle. <laughs> I, I knew that we would be back point because there was just so much to talk about and so today we're going to be diving a little bit deeper into one specific topic before we go there like a brief context overview for those who haven't seen her interview yet but you guys will go back and watch it after this i suppose um so joelle was kind of conned well kind of she was conned by this guru this yogi who claimed to have special powers it was a slow and steady thing where just a little bit at a time he got his claws into her ended up marrying him and they were together for about 18 years and she realized it was kind of this long con to exploit her financially he was exploiting other people financially um he was claiming to channel people which the people or the one person he was channeling was needing to have a sexual relationship with somebody else. So he was using that as a way to kind of quote ethically cheat on her. It was this whole big mess and she got out and she wrote a book about it. The secret practice, uh, 18 years on the dark side of yoga. Was that the name? Yep. That's right. Okay. Perfect. And it's great. I, I started reading it. I wasn't able to finish it before I interviewed, but there's so much good stuff in there for anyone who is interested. And also a little caveat, uh, we are not saying that anyone who does yoga is in a cult or all yogic practices are culty. However, they absolutely can be. People can absolutely be manipulated by these charismatic manipulative leaders and so that's what we're speaking on today is how this specific leader, this yogi guru, was able to con not only Joel here, but a whole bunch of other people out of thousands and thousands of dollars. So did I miss anything? No, I think you summarized it really well. Okay, great. <laughs> Great. And thank you guys for joining us. I see some people in the chat here. Thank you so much for joining us early in the morning. We normally do the nighttime lives, but Joelle is in the UK, so we're kind of trying to figure out the right time zone and the right time to go live. So thanks so much for joining us, guys. All right. So let's start, Joelle, with just the ways in which he was able to manipulate or convince people that he had these special powers, whether that's from your own experience or from things that you noticed as you were around him. Okay. So you mean once we started the yoga studio or, or at any point, just a at little bit about any him point. for our audience. Yeah. Yeah. Think, you know, it was a real cultivated persona. I think that when he was in that mode, guru mode, we can call it, there were different um, tools that he used. In India, he took up the title of Swami, which is known in, in Hindu culture um, as a, a celibate monk or as a spiritual man. It's a bit murky because sometimes these Swamis do marry, so I can never quite tell exactly, but orders of Swamis are supposed to be celibate monks. But the fact that he took the title gave him that authority. And also when I mm. first met him, he was wearing orange clothing, which again is the color of senior swamis i think i believe students wear white um, and then at a certain level they wear orange so i think one of the ways was he was able to adopt this persona through clothing through title through tone of voice and the way he spoke um, one of the things we didn't touch on yesterday it's a fairly minor detail but he told me that in his young in his youth he wanted to be an actor um i think what i will oh my preface, god <laughs> it all what, comes what, together <laughs> well, what I will preface, and it, just a caveat, if you know anyone's had a relationship with someone like this after the fact, you do doubt everything. But let's assume that that was true. He certainly had an actor's ability to take on different roles. Mm -hmm. And there were times early on where he would change, his face would change very drastically. And I would comment on it like, I used to call it like, I call it in my book, his androgynous face, like male, female, I couldn't quite tell. He sort of became this like ethereal being. And I said to him like, what's going on? And he like 
be like, oh, it's my night face. It's when the elders are here. Now, and so obviously that had an impact on me because it, it, it fed into the whole story of him being connected to the spiritual realms, having access to this higher knowledge that only he could then access and teach me. So he was mm -hmm. the intermediary. And yeah. now looking back, maybe we can say that, um, I don't know if it was subs like, maybe he was just taking substances, at, you know, and changing because he was well aware. Um, I, you know, we can touch, if we get to the part about the writing, we can talk about all the thinking I've had about what was true and wasn't. But you asked now about how he calmed people and yes, he could, you know, he could do that. I think for the people that we met in Paris, so for our viewers and listeners, um, you know, as Shalise said, we ended up opening a yoga studio in central Paris in a very prestigious area, um, you know, cost a lot of money to set it up. And I really put poured, I can honestly say my heart and soul into it. It was my sort of life mission at the time, but it relied on him and his knowledge. So I always felt like I was the sidekick or like the mm. administrative manager to like <laughs> his Royal Highness, who was supposed to be, you know, welcome, you know, teaching his knowledge. And there, I think he looked different. Um, people, you know, he had charisma, presence. Um, he was very brash, arrogant, confident. So he just said he knew things. And people, I think, had one of two reactions with him. I think you got people who were intrigued. And then you probably had people, the ones you never hear upon, about again, who just were put off. Like, it's not that he was universally uh, attractive to people. Liked. But he, mm -hmm. yeah, liked. And he even had a whole story around why that might be. He said to me, well men are sometimes threatened by me and right. Indian men are threatened by me. And that's just a story because it could be that in his own culture, he was easier to detect. Yes. I'm so glad you brought that problem. up because I wanted to mention that. And I think other people in the comments had also talked about how it's really the foreigners who fall for these gurus. And so can we sidetrack a little bit? Cause I wanted to sure. your opinion on if you felt like most of the people who did follow him and get sucked into him were foreigners who couldn't really detect these kind of fake guru-y things on their own. I think there's definitely a lot to that. I mean, the vast majority of people who became attracted to him, either when I first met him in India or later on through the studio, uh, wouldn't have known a whole lot about uh, Hinduism, the Swami tradition, yoga. They would take what he said at face value. A right, bit like okay. I, not maybe to the extreme, but still believe what he had to say. I mean, having said that, there was... Um, an Indian woman early on who had come from the UK, you know, at the same time that I met him, who really liked what he had to say. So I wouldn't put it that there's no Indian people who would fall for it. Um, mm -hmm. There's also other people who would not be interested in the yoga teaching, but be interested in getting to know him as a person because he was charismatic and he kind of liked to wheel and deal. Like yoga wasn't the only, you know, um, <laughs> the only feather in his hat, so to speak. He had other things. And so one, I tended to notice a pattern, which I couldn't understand at the time, where people might initially like him, but at some point, somehow the relationship would break, mm -hmm. um, particularly um, with this, you know, Indian man that he, that, that, that we met um, at the same time. But then there were others who remained friends for life. So I think it's, it's a mixed, um, situation but I do think Indians have a different view of yoga um, mm -hmm. than we do outside of India and it, it might be a good time to say because we talk about like what's the definition of yoga that traditionally before the last hundred years yoga wasn't a thing in India um, it, in the sense that Hinduism is structured around a caste system and yogis were outside the caste system so your priests are within that Hindu structure. And yogis were known as people who were outside of society. And they were always these oh. bands of men. That's so interesting. 
Yeah, so it wasn't at all this, this sort of general practice that we think of now accessible to everybody. It was sort of outside the confines of society, of a highly structured society with its ranks and its orders and its kingdoms. I mean, India was a collection of kingdoms that, well, you know, so not to go too deep into Indian history. So it's um, yoga wasn't really a thing. I think about at the start of the 20th century, you saw it develop as a practice, um, a physical practice with, you know, maybe breathing exercises, maybe some Sanskrit in there, but it was created much more recently than people realize. Mm. Yeah, I think that in the West, we do romanticize that culture. And mm. that's not to say it's a good or a bad thing. I think it's possible that it's been misconstrued, like you're mentioning, and people are kind of putting their own meaning into it and making it something bigger or something more sacred. You've mentioned this before to me that mm -hmm. the actual practice of yoga isn't necessarily sacred. It's just great exercise. And I don't want to offend anybody because I know that just like with anything, you can have incredible spiritual experiences mm. when you're really tuned in and you're tapped into yourself and you're breathing and you're mindful and I don't want to discredit that at all, but for what it was initially created for, I think it's kind of been changed and evolved a little bit. I think, I wish I remember the name of the comic. It was this Indian man and he was saying how in the West, at the end of all the yoga classes, it's the namaste. And he was saying that, he's like, I don't think you guys know what that actually means because <laughs> in India, it's more of like, Hey, what's up? And so at the end of the class, it's like everyone's saying, what's up to you? What's up to you? And it's like not really what they think it means. Did you find that? Or now that you can look back, are you seeing those types of inconsistencies? Yeah, I mean, I think that, as you say, to, to make yoga um, interesting, I don't know what the right word is, appealing or draw people in, these things are added in and I mean you know some classes will have the namaste some won't some will mm -hmm. om some will not at all you know with the om chanting mm -hmm. and ironically Arun was all like none of that in our classes no Sanskrit no chanting um oh. and because I think what he was I don't know what that was about but I think he said what we teach in our Paris studio is just the physical practice the physical benefits and that's it. Shalice, are you still there? Oh, there yes. you are. <laughs> Jonathan's moderating, so he's just um, playing with the screens. Oh, um, no worries. Yeah. 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 So, so he, he, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So he did. So he, that was something that was important to him. And sometimes we'd get um, teachers who would come and kind of want to work in our studio. And they knew that he was, they had bought in that he was a master of Agni Yoga, this yoga of fire. And I think the fact that he, you know, hung his hat on that. And that was his thing. It's the yoga of fire. It comes from the Himalayas. You know, it kind of sp spared him from a lot of questioning. And so this one um, teacher came in and said, well, you know, even in Iyengar yoga, they have like some kind of mantra or like, I don't know, because I don't practice Iyengar yoga, but they have some things that they say in Sanskrit, I think is to honor the master or some short prayer. And she said, can we have an Agni yoga prayer? And he was like, absolutely not. Uh, there is no, we're not praying in our physical practice. Do you think that's because he didn't know one? Possibly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, mean, I, I think he didn't know one. I think we also, to be fair, we were saying that it's a great practice for your body, for your mind, but in the studio, in the confines of that public facing uh, space we're not mm. trying to be a spiritual establishment. Maybe That's he was really also surprising. worried about getting attention. Yeah, I think he was, <clears throat> he might have been, you know, he, I think he took a line about what his con was. And he was like, I'm not a guru. I'm not a public personality. Like that was one of his lines. In fact, he knew Bikram, and we can talk about that in a minute. So and I've he, been like, trying to get some people from, from that documentary. Yeah, okay. yeah. So he, um, so his, so I'll just finish up on his line and then we'll talk about his feelings about Bikram. He was like, I'm not a guru. I think he kind of wanted to present himself as not spiritual, not religious, and maybe felt it was safer 
because as you said, I think you rightfully said, if he made up a prayer and then somebody comes in and says, what are you saying? So he kind of knew what he could and couldn't con about. Yeah. And he claims, uh, and, I, and I see no reason to, that this wouldn't have helped or hurt the con, but he claims that he met Bikram very early on in LA before Bikram was well-known and famous. And he did yoga with Bikram. He, Bikram and, you know, his two Indian men, similar age or whatever, got, you know, he, Bikram let him uh, practice in a corner of the studio. And it was like hot yoga. I don't know if it was outdoors, but it was one of the earliest ones. And apparently um, at some point, according to Arun, he said to Bikram, you're letting the power go to your head. And Bikram didn't like that. Now, this whole conversation I'm relaying is way before the Bikram scandals. Okay, this conversation between mm-hmm. me and Arun took place before any of that. And apparently then Bikram kicked it, kicked him out and <laughs> said he couldn't come back to the studio. But I oh think, as God. I told you, sometimes with the Indian men, like at first, maybe there's an initial, like they get along and then something happens. Um, but he claims he got all, he got his, first clients in LA from Bikram and some pretty famous names and some mm-hmm. really high flying clients, uh, which he was getting as massage clients. Okay. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the specific cons and I'm surprised that he wouldn't paint himself as a spiritual master because he mm-hmm. was doing a lot of these spiritual things to manipulate people or maybe doing these spiritual things. We don't mm-hmm. really know. So what are some of the ways that he would con people or these special powers that he claimed to have? Yeah, so I think he still, he said, I think he let people come to him. So I think that the reason it was probably in his interest to kind of control when he did the spiritual con is I think he wanted to like appear probably normal or (laughs) we already said there's no such thing as normal, but, uh, you know, not, not have any uh, reason for people to suspect him. But Mm. then if someone took a special interest, male or female, and said, I want to know more, like, what is this Agni Yoga? What can it do for me? You know, you said that it will help me live a long time or be this amazing health tonic. Then he'd be like, you need to come and learn from me one on one. And I think that's where he did more like maybe individual, maybe he knew some hypnosis. I'm just now I'm just speculating with you and the you know Mm -hmm. you know that maybe he was doing because that's where he felt comfortable he was fine teaching a group class and people loved it because he had like he he said he had a martial arts training and it was tough and dynamic and people like oh this is the hardest yoga I've ever done and like you know so so but it was all on the physical and he like had prided himself I think when he was younger he must have had like a very good body and he had like an okay body in his older years but people could see (laughs) that he'd that he'd been that he was built up right that he'd not just kind of sat on a couch his whole life which he was doing Mm -hmm. in his older years but um one-on-one I think he he is where where he would bring people into um his what I think of as his influencer orbit and he would set a really high high price for the one-on-one training sometimes and he would vary things a lot which is kind of how it shows us it's a con like sometimes it was eight weeks sometimes it was ten weeks he always wanted 5,000 euros in cash, like people, you know, and people agreed. They didn't, they weren't like, this is weird. You guys have an official business, but now to learn from him, I need to pay in cash. So, mm-hmm. and people, I, I just want to point it out because, you know, yes, I suspended, um, you know, judgment and disbelief, but other people did as well. They thought, well, this is worth learning. And these people were much like, it happened to be that most of them were older than me, knowledgeable, and they just saw this man. And, you know, some now that I'm a little bit more aware of cults, maybe they saw me as well. And they're like, oh, well, his wife looks like she's not going to harm us. So the pair of mm-hmm. us, people knew we were married. And even though I know this is bad to say, Shalise, but I didn't value myself at the time and my contribution. But the reality is people could see I was running the studio with him. So mm-hmm. I, you know, they were like, well, if she's, a, you know, if she's accepting him and they knew our age difference, they may not know our exact ages, but they could see it. Then one on one, he would, you know, uh, teach them. And I think he taught different things to different people. 
Yeah. So it, and that's what I want to talk about as well. Course. Hmm. Yeah, because I don't think there's anything wrong with paying someone to learn something, right? It, it makes sense. But were these people actually getting something new out of him? Were they really transforming themselves? Were they happy with what they ended up paying him? Yeah, you know, that's a that's such a good question. And I, I think that by and large, people didn't come and like ask for their money back. <laughs> So, or none of them did. So that's one thing. I think they felt, you know, it's the power. I put it down to the power of the mind. So yes, I think they got something from it. They similar to me. So there's some strands that are very similar to when I learned from him, which was roughly again, mm -hmm. two months, two to three months. We're getting that individual attention every day to improve yourself, partly your physical, you know, maybe it was your strength, your flexibility, your breathing. So he's teaching you slow, deep breathing. All of that is helping. And mm -hmm. they are now locked into him that this is like really important knowledge. So they're primed like I was primed to take it on um, and then obviously to feel the benefits. I mean, I feel the same thing. If I look back, I can use myself as an example. I thought I was a changed person as well. And in the beginning, I was kind of because I had been insecure and that gave me that little boost that, OK, you know, I'm doing something now. I'm doing something that's good for my body, for my mind. All that is positive thinking that I was giving myself. And we can't completely discount the amount of attention that he was giving me and then these clients. You um, mm -hmm. wanted to earn that money in some way, not through too much work, but through some work. <laughs> I mean, he wasn't going to like, uh, I don't know, give him an extra week or something. He was very like savvy about what he was doing, but he was focused on them. And people felt at the end, you know, like one felt like, you know, opening his own yoga studio. And then maybe they go into other teachers and add learning, but they had no problem saying, I learned from an authentic Himalayan master. Mm, and was he authentic in any sort of way or did he just make that whole persona up? I don't know what kind of physical practice he was raised with, um, whether it just he went to the gym and lifted weights. <laughs> you know, it could have been something like I I don't know. And I one of the things I later thought about um, is I never did see him meditating until the very end. There was, yeah, I mean, there was a towards the end in the last few couple years or three years I was with him, he, he suddenly started to do breathing exercises with me. Uh, he gave me like a new protocol of three. They're called like pranayamas, which are like specific breathing exercises. One of them you might've heard of is like alternative nostril breathing. Mm -hmm. one, is, one is this really quick, like kind of breathing, like, like just exhale really quickly. And then one was like deep, slow breathing. So he came up with this like new protocol from the elders, 20 minutes of that, like really rapid breathing, um, 20 minutes or so of the alternate nostril, and then like 20 minutes of slow breathing. So that was a lot like that. Or yeah. maybe it was, it was like a long stretch of breathing. And I don't know if he'd gotten to the point in his life, because he'd had a bad accident, where he's like, Oh, I need to, you know, take my own medicine now. But leaving that aside, I can say that I never saw him meditating. I did see him take afternoon naps every day, during which he like long naps, like an hour or two, during which he claimed to be traveling to the other side. But looking back, I think that was a convenient way to just to sleep or he used to drink in the afternoons and to like sleep off the alcohol. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What were some of the other things? Because you had mentioned in your interview that he was trying to get $7,000 from your mom to put her prayers in a temple. I feel like I'm ruining the details. But what were some of the other ways that he would try to get money from people? Yeah, I mean, you're right. Most of the way he either outright borrowing. Um, uh, and I think he tested people. He was testing people all the time to see if he could borrow money from them. And he even had a whole philosophy like, your true friends will lend you money. And if someone refuses to lend you money, they're not your true friend. That's manipulative. Yeah. Yeah. And and it was like a way to test them. He's like, oh, look, look at how attached human beings are to their money. So you test them, they tell you they like you, but now you ask them to borrow some money. And if they don't, so he he would create these stories 
that would absolutely fulfill um, what he wanted to do. But yes, it was his yoga teaching or his teachings and just straight out borrowing. I don't think there were any other real like business ventures. Uh, you know, he was getting, he was borrowing so much through me that I think it was like more than he probably expected to be able to, to extract yeah. from any one person. Sure, sure, sure. So someone wants to know, and I think this will go into a little bit of your deconstruction. Do you still practice yoga? Yeah, I get asked that <laughs> in most of the talks or, you know, interviews I give. You know, there's, I, I like to say there's one, I feel like I've done enough for a lifetime. <laughs> so I don't. <laughs> the, short, <laughs> the short answer is no, um, it, but we all, we, but it's a more complex than that. It's like, what do we mean by yoga? So for me, I was always, as I said in the interview uh, with Shalise or in the podcast that we had is, you know, for me, it was always a spiritual quest. And it was so deeply ingrained in me to sit quietly and do some of those like controlled breathing practices that even after I was divorced from Maroon, I was just mechanically starting my day sitting like that. And then one day I had a wake up call and I thought, what am I doing? I now know this was a con. Why am I still doing this? To be fair, before I had that final, like, I'm never, I'm not, I don't need to be doing this anymore. It was kind of breaking off because I think this was really, in a way, it was like a great con to be like, you must meditate every single day. I did not skip a day. Like, I love writing and I have tried to write most days, but I don't chastise myself if I skip a day. There's tons of days I don't sit and write because of whatever, you know, maybe I'm traveling and it's, it's not a big deal. It's not, I'm not being controlled by my love of writing, but with yeah. meditation, it was like, so it was almost implied that something bad would happen that day if I didn't meditate. Mm. Maybe not in so many words, but implied or certainly like this is the most important thing. Like you need to maintain this thing. And I think you could say, well, Joel, how did you not notice he wasn't meditating? He always created a difference between himself and like me or others. He's like, well, I'm, I don't need to anymore. Or I'm already, like I said, with the afternoon naps, I'm already traveling to see the elders. I don't need the actual practice. But right. I think the fact that I meditated every day it kept me like locked in. It kept me from really questioning like a lot of what was happening. And yes, if you do that in the morning, you do feel calm. And I did feel calm, but I think I was also numbing myself. Yeah, it also sounds like a fear-based ritual. It's not something that maybe you enjoyed as much as you should have if you were to just do it on your own, like the writing, for example. And I have something similar. I remember we were always told to read our scriptures or the Book of Mormon growing up Mormon. And yeah. they would say, you have to read your scriptures every night. And then when I wouldn't and I would have a nightmare, I'm like, oh, it's because I didn't read my scriptures that night. And I didn't even know what I was reading. I mean, I was falling asleep every night. When I was like trying to figure out what these words meant. But it was a fear-based ritual. It wasn't something that I actually wanted to do. And it was controlling me in a way that was not healthy for my mentality. Mm. No, definitely. I mean, and I think in my case, I, I feel like I did enjoy it. I'm surprised how long I would sit and do it, like easily half an hour. I mean, it, so so now I do like to sit quietly. It's a long roundabout answer. Do you still do yoga? I like I think it's a great idea to sit quietly for a few moments before you start your main day. Like it's not the very first thing I do. I have a cup of coffee. I, <laughs> you know, I might have a bite or something. But before I start work, I do sit down quietly. But it's it's only a few minutes. I gather my thoughts. You know, I might pray if I feel like it. It's, it's just something for me, like my intention for the day or what I'm thinking. But it's nothing like the length of time I used to do it. And I don't remember Shalise not liking it. But you're right. Thinking back, it was like very much part of my identity. I'm Joelle and I mm -hmm. meditate. And like I would tell people, like it was something that I was quite comfortable being like, you know, I do yoga, I meditate. For me, the two were very linked up. I, um, if you want, we can talk about the physical part, you know, at some point and what, sure. you know, what I think about that, but I don't want to just talk yeah, about Yeah. Well, do you want to talk about it now? Yeah. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, for a lot of people, I don't know, you know, uh, what their understanding is of yoga, but for a lot of people, it's a physical practice. And, 
they really enjoy, I think that it's, for some of them, it's slower, it's a bit of downtime, it's a lot of stretching. And I think for me, when I got out of my controlling relationship in these 18 years, I needed something very different. Like I needed Mm -hmm. to dance, like I went to Zumba classes, like I needed to move, you know, I needed to feel my body again in a very different way and through space. Like we even had this teacher who who said it really well, like she wasn't anti if she was a yoga teacher, but she was like, yoga keeps you on this mat because she had done dance as well. And you're in this, I don't know if she called it two or three dimensional space, uh, two dimensional space. Whereas with dance and other practices, you're moving through space. And it's a very different feeling. I just got on a bicycle and like went on bicycle rides, you know, with my family again through, you know, this big park we have in Paris. And these things were feeding my soul um, in a different way. And Mm -hmm. I have gone back to yoga classes. I'm not anti-yoga, but I would say that the one thing um, with yoga that's different from other physical practices, you do not know what you're getting when you sign up. I mean, you might know, but you you have to try the teacher and it's just so varied because sometimes there's a lot of spirituality in there. And there's been one time where it wasn't for me. There was like some Sanskrit chanting and I could just, it was just the energy of the teacher. I felt like she was trying to be like, really influencing us through the chanting and I just that you know I never went back to her as an example um Mm -hmm. so yeah I think it's time I I enjoy other things now that I find are you know just as good for my body yeah it sounds like you found a really balanced place to be so not saying all yoga is evil or I disavow Mm -hmm. yoga and you're not saying I only do yoga still because it's so beneficial. It sounds like you've really broadened your horizons and found other things that work for you. So you're not so tunnel visioned into one thing. You take the good that you got from it and you leave the rest behind and you're following your gut and your intuition and what feels good and what doesn't feel good. I think that's a really good place to be. And that's something that I want to make sure everyone knows here is that we're not trying to say don't do yoga (laughs) because of course, just like with any cult, there's always going to be something that is good or else nobody would join it. There's always going to be something good you can take away. And so it's about recognizing the things that are good and setting aside the things that are not serving you. And maybe they served you at one point and they no longer serve you and it's okay to move through those and to let those go. So with writing your book, I know that it was kind of this transcendental experience where you were able to let go some of those things. You want to talk about that process? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think it was, you know, it was a very complicated time, as people who've heard the first uh, episode realize. And it was just so uh, it was I did need to deconstruct it. And a word I know now, I didn't know then. <laughs> and by writing things down, I was able to see them for, for myself, probably in a way that might have taken a long time otherwise. I think writing down, you know, everything that happened and figuring out, figuring for myself, like, you know, what had been his intentions? Why did he do this? Was there any spiritual basis in what he did? And obviously, I cannot know 100% that there was no spiritual energies I just felt like whatever it was it was like evil it was not good I mean you could I knew that when I was with him you know and after he left I could feel that something very like terrible had happened uh you know through whether it was his energy whether it was his intentions whether it was just the manipulation something so So writing it helped me to kind of process that. And I took a a position in the book to, you know, more about, you know, his influence style, you know, because I, you know, I don't know what else um, to call it. But I would say that that really changed my view of things. Uh, I had Mm -hmm. gone into it naively. And I know, Shalise, you just said, obviously, you know, yoga is good and can be good. I think the only issue I have with new age or not the only, but one of the issues I have with new age thinking that I don't agree with now is there's this tendency to think that everybody's good and the core of everyone is good and we just need to tap into it. And, you know, if you're not tapping into the good, you're not meditating well enough. And that is simply not my experience having been with someone like that. I now know that there are things you need to leave. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, people said, Oh, you liked him at one time. 
my bad. Like you know, there was no reason to like him. There was, you know, it doesn't make it right, you know, or, you know, you got something good out of it. You know, I don't disown my past because I think we are the product of our, of our experiences and having experienced that has given me a vision I would not have had. Otherwise, I don't know how, you know, what else life had in store for me. So I don't feel regret, but it's still a fact that part of what Arun was peddling is it's that you can't actually pinpoint that I'm doing something wrong. And now I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> like there are things where I will take a stand and I'll say no, and there will not be an excuse as to me accepting it. Like mm -hmm. we were like, there's a higher reason to accept that. So, yeah, no, I agree with you that within that mystical thinking, there can be some toxic positivity where people are saying, oh, no, there's good in everyone, like you said. And maybe it it makes you forget or not see some of the red flags in somebody who you maybe shouldn't be around. And that's not yeah. to say that we shouldn't love everybody or attempt to love everybody, but also have a healthy amount of discernment, right? And understand that you don't have to have a relationship with everybody to extend love and kindness to everybody either. So there can be that balance there. Yeah, I love what you say there because like someone, I had a, like a, a sympathetic reader who knows me was like, I hate Arun. <laughs> like that was, was, you know, a great, a great reaction. I'm, I'm so cool. You know, I'm fine that he said that. And, um, and, and I'm like, okay, like, I was like, and he's like, don't you? And I'm like, you know what? Like, I don't, want to be tied up with him and i feel like hating him would keep me connected so no mm. like i don't want to waste my energy hating him um maybe as i continue to process the emotions after publication so writing was incredibly helpful to just get things straight in my head and also mm -hmm. i'll be honest i wanted to you know if people are going through something like this and part of writing and speaking about it like i'm doing now is just know that you aren't alone and these stories do exist. I felt very alone, you know, through my experience. So part of writing and sharing is, you know, for people to feel like they don't, they're not alone through this kind of experience. Yeah. It's so amazing that you were able to do that because it is very vulnerable and it's, it's scary when you put your traumas out there for everybody to see and dissect and comment on just coming on shows like this. It's a very vulnerable space where you can actually see people's comments and what they think. And that's why I always tell people, you know, our guests read the comments. So leave those words of encouragement because I know I'm one of those people who there's like a bajillion amazing comments. And then there's that one that just like sticks with you, you know, the, the negative comment. And you're like, damn it. Why did I have to see that? Because it, it does hurt and it is a scary place to be. So being vulnerable like that and putting yourself out there is so incredible to help other people so they don't feel so alone and they don't feel as ashamed because there's a lot of shame that comes with falling into these situations. Mm -hmm. And maybe even for whether it's eight months or 18 years in your case, there's always going to be this like, oh, why didn't I get it? Why didn't I see it? And we've all been there, at least the ones who have left cults, right? We get it. We're like, yep, yeah. I fell for it, but what are you going to do? So it's really amazing that you're willing to come forward and share to help other people feel not so alone. I want to go and look at the comments here because I've been <laughs> neglecting them. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> um, we have oh, yes. <laughs> a super chat from Joel. He's... um. He's always popping on and supporting. Thank you so much. He says, off to work. Much love and support as always. Thank you guys for everything you do. Shalise and Joelle. You too, Jonathan. Yes, he's over there. <laughs> yeah, he's, we know you're back <laughs> yeah. there moderating. Thank you so much for that super chat. We are going to wrap up here in a few minutes, guys. So if you do have any final questions, you can put them in the chat and Jonathan will star them for me to look at. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Oh, this is interesting. I'm curious if the guest was raised in a religion. I think that such an upbringing leaves people more vulnerable to mm -hmm. other scams and gurus. We kind of touched on this a little bit, but if you want to um, talk about that, that would be great. 
Yeah, so just a couple things. Like my first exposure to religion was um, I was raised Christian in the Catholic uh, Church as a child, but I was taught to pray the Lord's Prayer at night, and that stayed with me like my whole life. So I was raised a Christian, but from the age of 12, my mom started to in involve me in her new age explorations. So I was exposed at a young age to meditation and more what I would think of like magical thinking type meditations where the first one was around like envisioning lights and all kinds of things. I know we I don't want to go into too much detail, but yeah, I think that having been exposed to new age thinking and meditation, especially through my mom, whom I trusted, and I knew she was getting or I thought she was getting benefits from it. That's why she was bringing her kids along. Uh, definitely, that was absolutely one of the ways that I was able to accept Arun, because for me, he was part of a tradition that I had been exposed to really young. Yeah, that makes sense. And if this is too personal, you don't have to answer it, but do you still have a relationship with your mom? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. It never broke. <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're, you know, and I think she, she went on a journey. I actually had to, I mean, I apologized to her uh, after I left Arun because I felt like I had hurt her so badly by being with her, with him. And she'd been so worried about me. And she did not know if she would ever get me back. So mm -hmm. we have, you know, built on that. And now, you know, she's also... Um, you know, I, I share what I've learned with her and we're probably closer than we've ever been. Oh, that's great. So do you feel like yeah. she still leans toward the magical thinking or is she kind of shifted as well? I think she shifted as well. I mean, when I pick up anything, I still were like, wait a minute here. <laughs> she knows that I've like returned to my Christian faith and that's my anchor. And a way, I don't think I ever lost it, but I combined it with other things. And when mm -hmm. I say Christian faith, I just find a lot of comfort in a loving God. Uh, mm -hmm. That brings me comfort knowing that there is a loving God and the universe isn't just spinning out of control. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, and that we <laughs> <laughs> I know. And I just feel like today, you know, a lot of people will question that kind of belief. And some will not, but some will. Um, but to me, that was really missing. Although I transferred some of that belief in a loving God to, you know, Babaji was, a, you know, he's like the supreme yogi. So right. Jesus, I was praying to Babaji and like I was sort of transferring. It's interesting. That it's always these male figures as well, but that's a whole other <laughs> problem. But um <laughs> Uh, yeah, Arun, uh, funnily enough, like early on, I'll just say this one little anecdote that Arun somehow, I, one, I'm sure he, I must have told him, but I felt like he was reading my mind because he was like, why do you pray to like a male God? You're a woman, you should be praying to a female. And mm. he actually like tried to get me to like to pray to the goddess. And it's funny just that maybe because my upbringing or whatever that I, that I never found that as easy. And that's just a personal, personal thing. Uh, but I guess I don't think God is gendered, so <laughs> we're good there. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> my faith okay, is, yeah. Um, is strong. Yeah, that's a great answer. Someone <laughs> here wants to know if you truly wholeheartedly loved him. Yeah, lo I love that question. <laughs> um, you know, I think I was enthralled and enthrallment and emotional connection can feel a lot like love. I certainly believed mm -hmm. I was in love with him. I, I love the wholeheartedly. I'm not sure wholeheartedly. I mean, pretty soon when we moved in together, not we had a long distance relationship and I didn't see a lot of his habits there. But when we moved in together in France, uh, you know, the, the way he was behaving, I was really struggling to accept any of it. So I think part of me did not love him wholeheartedly, but I was absolutely bonded with him. Some would even mm -hmm. say trauma bonded, but I was, you know, I was more bonded with him than truly loving. Yeah. I also didn't sense. give him that much space. So I think, yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is probably one of our last questions. So Gregory wants to know, how do you use your own intuition to avoid situations like this? My intuition is a little messed up due to my toxic Christian past. Not saying all Christianity is toxic, but mine was. What do you think, Joelle? Yeah, you know, what I use is I do trust my own first instincts more. 
and then I let them be corrected. Like, you know, very early on, um, one example is very early on, we were not romantically involved. I was just starting to learn from him. So it was to teach a student spiritual relationship. I caught a glimpse of him from a distance. Um, he was talking to these other people and his eyes really worried me. Like they looked so dull, like there was no light in his eyes. And I remember the thought that crossed my mind. It was the really the, the deepest doubt I ever had. I said, his eyes look like the eyes of a dead man, like they're not alive. I And I said to myself, I even put these exact words in my book, I'm like, strange for a yogi. Now, mm. it's hard to whoever, you know, to Gregory, who asked this question, like, it is hard because it was a fleeting moment. And I soon, you know, uh, like, Pat, you know, uh, uh, forgot about it. But I would just say, trust your instincts and, you know, lean into them. And as you do so, I think you will change. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you, if you, if you lean in more to your own belief and that, uh, you know, you love yourself and you value yourself, then this is part of the change that you can make. Yeah. I loved what you said about trusting your gut instinct first, but then allowing yourself to be corrected. I think that's such a huge thing because many of us who were in cults thought we were following our intuition and thought that we were tapped in. Mm. And if someone tried to correct us, we're like, um, no, you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. So I think being open to new information is probably key. And yeah, I think one thing that I always that always comes to mind is when someone shows you who they are, believe them the first time. I think that's a big one because when you get a glimpse of somebody and you don't feel right about it, I think it's our human nature to want to be like, oh, but this or but that, or maybe they just had a bad day or maybe it won't happen again. It almost always does. And if it doesn't sit right with you, you don't have to have a relationship with that person, whether it's a friend, whether it's an acquaintance, whether it's even a family member. And I'm not saying just go cut off your family, but if you see mm. these repeating patterns over and over and over that are really affecting your mental health. There's nothing wrong with setting boundaries. There's nothing wrong with creating distance. There is nothing wrong with doing what is best for you and your own inner peace. So great answer, Joelle. Love having okay. you on. You're awesome. <laughs> you um, gave a great answer, Shalise. Thank you for teaching <laughs> us. Seriously. <laughs> Yeah. And to yeah. Her, and remember, there's no absolutes as well. I mean, like, um, you know, I'm married to Trevor and both of us try to use our discernment and I try to, you know, keep him on the right track. He tries to keep me on the right track. And he's been a little bit worried about me, like falling for another guru. Uh, and so sometimes he's like, oh, like, you know, so so sometimes he will just say, like, are you like sure or whatever? And so I do, as you said, try to use discernment at every step, not just once. Right. Mm -hmm. It's just to make sure that I'm not, uh, <laughs> you know, getting starry eyed about something again. <laughs> Yeah. And also to add to that, it's okay to change your mind about something. So maybe there are no mm. red flags and everything is peachy in the beginning and someone mm. is incredible and warm and loving and then they turn into something that's very different. It's okay mm. to change your mind. And that's another big thing is sometimes people feel like, well, I've known this person forever. I can't just cut them off. Well, you can. <laughs> if, if they're presenting yeah. in a way that doesn't feel good to you, that doesn't align with who you want to be and how you want to act because ultimately the people around us change the way that we present ourselves. If you don't like the person you're becoming by being around this other person, it's okay to change your mind. It's okay to walk away. It's okay to set new boundaries. So there's just, there's a lot there. I think we could have a whole discussion on <laughs> intuition and setting boundaries and doing what's yeah. right for you. But this is about the end of the live stream. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing all of your thoughts. Thank you so much for having me. This has been great, Jalise. Thanks for the conversation. Yeah, of course. And thank you guys for joining in with us. Um, there's a really sweet comment here that I just have to show because it makes me smile. Off topic, love seeing the top of your baby bump. Yes, she <laughs> is <laughs> enormous. Well, according to our doctor's appointment, she's exactly where she should be. And that's great. And I'm very grateful. But I'm very excited to not be pregnant anymore. <laughs> so thank you for that. Very sweet of you. Um, and is there anything else that I'm missing before we go, Jonathan? Okay. Well, 
Oh, yeah. So definitely go check out her book. We linked it in the description below so you guys can just one click away. And we also linked the whole entire interview that we did with Joelle. You can click that and watch that more of her story in depth. And is there anything else that you wanted to say, Joelle, before we wrap up? No, I think we've taught we've said a lot of things. And I would just say that remember that the most important thing is you deserve love and you are valuable. And if you hang on to that, I think it's a good guidance. I agree. And people are always like, where's the Linda listen? We don't really do them on the lives, but if we did, that would be a great Linda listen. <laughs> so go check out Joelle guys. Her Instagram is also listed in the description as well as her website, joeltamras.com. And until next time, follow your highest excitement, be conscious and be well.